Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Dillon, Chair of the Economic Club of Chicago, and I'm really thrilled to be here today to introduce our guests, Zanny Mitten Bettos. Today will be our guest speaker, and David Brancaccio, our moderator. At no time in our recent history has it been, frankly, more important to hear from one of the most influential global voices in journalism. Zanny Mitten Bettos is the 17th editor in chief and the first woman of the 179 year old influential weekly newspaper focused on current affairs, international business, politics, technology, and culture. Educated at Oxford and Harvard, her 28 years with the paper, the last seven as editor, were preceded by positions working for the Minister of Finance in Poland and the International Monetary Fund. We're also really fortunate to have with us today as moderator, David Brancaccio, the host and senior editor of the widely regarded Marketplace Money Report on Public Radio and the PBS News Magazine Now. David is the Peabody and Emmy Award-winning journalist who many of you remember for his thoughtful coverage while anchoring Marketplace on the, days of the, the day of the attacks of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. So thank you both for being here. Before we begin, I do encourage the audience members to use the Q&A button on your screen to ask questions, submit them for the discussion today, and David will select them as we get through the program. I'll now pass it on to David. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for the opportunity. Hi, Chicago land. I wish I was there, but maybe soon we'll be there. Um, Hey, by the way, do submit your questions. Uh, although if you don't do that, you're going to hear a lot of me and that's not optimal situation. Hi, Zanny. How are you? I am very well. Hi, David. Hi, Mary and, and everybody in Chicago. <laughs> Zanny and I go way back. She's been appearing on my program <laughs> since I was about this high and she was about that high. Um, who would have thought when you said yes to this, Zanny, that my first questions would not be about pandemic. <laughs> um, but we'll get to that uh, a little later in the program. We have another, um, some other fish to fry. Um, how hard has it been for The Economist to get what's really happening out of Ukraine and out of Russia? Well, it is true. I, I did say yes to joining this program before the invasion happened. Um, I, you just reminded me of that. And it's it, it feels like another world away. And actually, uh, and this is a sort of roundabout way of answering your question, but before the invasion, um, our defense editor at The Economist, who is absolutely world-class journalist and expert, defense expert, and our Russia editor, who is equally um, world-class and brilliant, had diametrically opposed views of the likelihood of an invasion, even up to the week before. And uh, I was saying, there are these two brilliant colleagues of mine, and they are both saying exactly the opposite. And, and that sort of set us up for, I think, um, what happened and what has happened since. And the answer to your question is that, I guess we rely on um, the considerable expertise of both of them and our team. Um, we have a number of people on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, who are seeing things for themselves. So this week, for example, um, when the news of the, the awful atrocities in Bucha came out, we had two people who verified it with their own eyes what had been going on. So we do that as much as we can. Um, and then I rely on really serious expertise. So our, our defense editor is extremely well plugged into uh, the military on both sides of the Atlantic is is absolutely sort of au fait with what their thinking is. Um, our Russia editor, who is no longer in Russia, um, was in Russia until really very recently. It's now too dangerous, um, uh, but has a huge network and is very plugged in there. And the others who are working on the Ukraine story, similarly, so we we triage, we arbitrage, we we read, they read, you know, what's going on in Russian, they read the Ukrainian, as they talk to you know, the people on the ground, they have very close contacts. So it's like every other journalistic outfit, I'm sure like you guys too, you know, you 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 read everything that's out there. And this time in this war, it is extraordinary just how much is out there. I mean, the the this is really is a sort of social media war and you have to be able to, you know, see what is genuine, see what is not genuine. And that requires expertise. It, but it's also been helped, I think, enormously by open source intelligence. I mean, one of the other striking 
aspects of this whole invasion and the preamble to it was just how you know how much intelligence was released and how much it could be corroborated by you know individuals working in the kind of OSINT community, the open source intelligence community. That was to me another real eye opener and something that we've been able to use a lot of. So you put all of that stuff together, but I think the most important is just having really deep expertise. Yeah, I mean, it was a decision by President Biden and the administration on uh, on the U.S. side to make quite a bit of information available uh, early and often. Yeah, it, it was, and it was, you know, with hindsight, it was an absolutely brilliant move. And I think it was one that, you know, in Europe, this is this is no secret. Uh, many in the European governments, many in you know, European security services, ditto, were some were much more skeptical, and there was, I think, a sense that you know, the Americans were telling this story really, really. Um, but it was, you know, with hindsight, a brilliant way of countering Russian disinformation, a brilliant way of preempting and preventing, you know, President Putin from kind of creating some sort of, you know, false flag pretext for an invasion and an absolute, you know, dramatic success story. And I think coming in the aftermath of last year and, you know, what from the European perspective was the really, you know, we use the word debacle in Afghanistan, but but the kind of poor handling of Afghanistan, this was a really um, striking success for the US. And and I think shape, changed the, the way that this invasion was thought about and changed the reaction certainly was, I think, one of the big drivers for the speed of the very powerful Western response. We're going to stay on this topic, but I want to show our audience something that will seem very familiar to, to them because it's sitting on their coffee table right now, because everybody watching us now is a subscriber to the print edition. Uh, let's take a look at the cover of last week. There's a fresh cover on the way in the next couple of days. Um, that is President Zelensky of Ukraine. Zanny, you traveled there to talk to him in person? I did, and that picture was taken by the photographer who accompanied me. Um, and we have many more pictures uh, on our website and we have a YouTube video of the interview, um, which was done also by him and someone with him. Uh, yes, I, it was one of the more extraordinary experiences of my career. I went um, to Kiev, I guess now almost two weeks ago. Uh, we heard the weekend before that there might be the possibility of a one-on-one um, -on -one interview with President Zelensky. I said I would absolutely be on for it. It uh, was firmed up very quickly and a couple of days later we were on the way and I went with uh, my colleague Arkady Ostrovsky, our Russian editor, and we traveled, we flew to Warsaw, took, the, took a car to the border, across the border, took another car to Lviv and then took the overnight train to Kiev. And we're in Kiev for, um, I guess, the best part of two days. Um, and had, yeah, had this interview, which I think was the first one-on-one -on -one interview in person um, with, uh, the foreign press, um, uh, I, I possibly even with any press, but I think with the foreign press, certainly. And it was, well, um, Zanny, what, did it was... You, what did you make of him? Uh, you know, here's a guy who was an actor, but has been thrust into this extraordinary, terrifying situation. He was, he was pretty extraordinary. He was very, very authentic and very humane, very un sort of packaged. I mean, yes, you're right. Of course, he's an actor. Uh, and I'm sure he's a, he, he, if, you, if you've watched Servant of the People, you can see that he's a pretty good actor, but he wasn't acting. We spent more than an hour with him. He had no notes. He had no people around him sending him notes. We asked him, we peppered him with questions. It was uh, a conversation, a bit a slightly chaotic conversation in three languages. You know, I speak very, very poor Russian, certainly not good enough to do an interview in. My colleagues, the two who were with me spoke perfect Russian. He he actually indulged me by speaking English a lot. And if you watch the, it's it's worth watching a little bit of the YouTube version of the interview simply to see how good his English is. His English is actually really quite good. And there were, you know, much of the interview was in English. Occasionally he wanted to uh, speak in his native tongue. And then there was this kind of quite interesting discussion about what language he would speak. So he agreed that when he was responding to questions in Russian from my colleagues, he would he would respond in Russian. But he felt that if he was responding to my question in English, he ought to reply in Ukrainian. And you know, his native language is Russian. He grew up in a Russian speaker first and foremost. But you know, now as president of Ukraine, in light of what was going on, it was certainly felt by his age that he ought to be speaking Ukrainian. So that all three languages appear. It's a slightly chaotic mixture. 
but he he was really and he, he really answered the questions and there were often quite long pauses as he was thinking about them i remember i asked him what does the ukrainian victory look like and there was a long pause while he was thinking about how to answer that question then another time i asked him whether it would be possible to have lasting peace with president putin in the kremlin and again a long pause and he said i don't know and i don't think he knows um and he said he was he was very very genuine and very powerful and you can see why he is so successful at what is his role in this in this conflict which is to be the public face of ukraine bringing ukrainians together but also being their public face to the world and and he he he's when he's talking whether he's talking to congress whether he's speaking at the un uh, security council whether he's speaking at the grammys you know it is it, it's a genuine feeling and the genuineness of a man who is sort of channeling a, a a population that has come together in the face of this ghastly invasion. Um, he he was it was pretty powerful stuff. It was not it was so far from the kind of packaged politician that we might be used to um, in you know twenty first century Western politics. It was all a bit chaotic. Well, I, I want, uh huh. What did it seem you know, that, all of that way? It didn't seem that way on the outside. It was a little chaotic. You know, it's it's this is a this is a president and his aides at a time when you know they are you know target number one for the russians right so the even getting there was you know understandably was there was a lot of security and a lot of um going down darkened corridors and we had to change cars and go through all the checkpoints and uh, uh, understandably we had to leave everything all of our devices even our pens behind so that nothing that could possibly give away our location even inadvertently and so admits this sort of environment which is a war it's a you know, a war environment um we walked into the room at the end of these corridors and it's the room that you will have seen you know it's the room from which he he uh addressed congress it's the it, it's a room that frankly looks a little bit like a kind of you know corporate meeting room there's the white four mica table there's the high-backed modern chairs there's the big screens with the uh, ukrainian colors on and he came in with this group of aides and a couple of men with guns. And so it, it felt sort of slightly, you know, um, not makeshift, but 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 un, yeah, slightly disorganized. And, you know, they are sleeping, eating, sleeping. They are, you know, they've never left these various premises that they're in because they're, you know, the, the risks are too great. They go out to do some shots in the evening, but you know, I don't think he's seen his family. I don't know this actually, but I don't think he's seen his family for a long time. It's it's a it's a war zone. And yet he comes across as a very, very authentic, determined, and incredibly brave person. Let me ask you about this one section, because the whole YouTube cut that I saw was riveting. But there's a for me one really lean forward moment. Um, it's a section where President Zelensky divides the countries of the world into, I think, four categories. And one of the categories is people who want the war over quickly for humanitarian reasons, uh, which makes some sense. There's the, I want it over quickly, some countries, because they're Russian, they, they have a lot of Russian interests and they want to get back to business. But the first category he mentioned is, um, countries that want a protracted war, in his view, to really weaken Russia. And you came back to that after he laid out this scheme and suggested, did he mean the US in that category? Tell me about your thoughts when he laid it out that way. So I, you're right, I did come back and ask whether he meant the US and he didn't, he didn't, you, we, I think that bit is also in the, in the, in, on the YouTube video, he didn't say yes, he said, uh, the Americans have been helpful. They are, you know, there are different bits of America. Um, but I, I think it was sort of a, a, in his body language, there was sort of clearly some hinting that some elements in the US, put it that way, might be like that. Um, the fourth category that he talked about, which he was quite tough on, was countries um, such as Germany, which were countries that are balancing economic interests. Uh, and are you know have see Russia as a huge market and want to balance their interests there. So he you know, that again that was a I thought a remarkably candid way of describing and and categorizing the Western countries that are that he is reliant on for support. And he was pretty clear-eyed about what the 
what the individual interests were. And in laying out why, in his view, Ukraine needs both tougher sanctions and more arms. And this was, of course, we, I interviewed him before all of this week's horrific revelations about war crimes had come out. Um, it, it was a very compelling case that you know Ukraine needed both more weaponry, and he 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 made clear. He said, that, you know, there's a. I, I said to him, you know, President Macron has said that um, you know Western countries uh, can't you know give offensive weapons. That that's a red line that they won't cross. And and why do you think that is? And he just said very clearly, they're frightened of Russia. That's it. Well, they're frightened of Putin. I think he said. I, I, it was pretty. It was, it, that's what I meant when I said he's incredibly authentic. It was, there wasn't much sort of thinking too hard about what would be the appropriate kind of response. He was very honest. And, and just one other um, sort of anecdote from that, and I don't know if, if, if this jumped out at you too, but it's really stuck with me. I asked him towards the end of the interview about, about President Putin and, and kind of what he thought of President Putin. And he then started talking about um, Putin's attitude to Russian soldiers. And he said that they have lost 15,000 soldiers in the last month. That we've lost 15,000 in the last eight years of uh, war in Eastern Ukraine. And he said 15,000 soldiers. Putin is throwing soldiers as though they are logs into a train's furnace. And as he said that, his voice, his face was really pained as though he, he could not comprehend the kind of inhumanity and the cold aggression of someone like Putin. And it was just a very sort of powerful sense to me that he epitomized the, the opposite and that, that you know, Ukraine's defense was all about a people coming together to defend themselves against this extraordinary aggression. The very first weekend after Russia's invasion, I was with a bunch of national security experts, European and American, and an, uh, an academic asked a question. He, asked, he said, you know, is there an off ramp for Putin to de-escalate this? And the experts were like, well, what did you have in mind? You know, handing Eastern Ukraine to Russia, will that stop uh, Rus Russian expansionism? What do you think? Is there, is there a way, is there a, is there a way for Putin to that he could be offered or would take that would de-escalate this in, you know. It's a really good question. And it's one I've been, I've been thinking about, and I've been thinking about it a lot in, because the kind of converse of that question is the escalation risk. Because if there is no off-ramp, there is the escalation risk. And I was very struck, and I recommend this actually to, to anyone who's re wants to get a sort of an insight into Putin. For me, the, I asked, uh, our Russia editor, what was the best book to read about Putin? And he said, the, the book you should read is First Person, which is a book that was written based on transcripts of long conversations with Putin back in 2000, just as he just as he got to power. And it's really Putin in his own words. And in that, it's in that book that he tells the anecdote, which you may have heard of when he was a child in Leningrad, and he and his friends used to amuse themselves by chasing rats up and down the stairwell of their apartment block. And at one point he cornered a rat and the rat flew at him and then started chasing him. And he said, that's how I learned about human nature. And I learned what happens when people are cornered. And that sort of stuck with me because I thought to the degree that he doesn't have an off ramp and he feels cornered, that surely raises the escalation risk. But to, to get to your point about whether there is an off ramp, I think the, the good news is that Putin has so controlled the propaganda within Russia that he is able to create any reality he wants for the Russian people. And, and you saw that really towards the end of last week when suddenly you know, the, the, the official line in, in Moscow was that you know, the Russian military was moving to focus on what had been its target all along, which was Eastern Ukraine, and that somehow Kiev had never been a target, and that therefore the shifting of, of uh, military was nothing to do with any failure to take Kiev. And they can create these kind of um, narratives because it is a, it's a truly Orwellian place right now, and most Russians get most of their information from um, television, and that is completely and utterly controlled by Putin. So. If he can, what he needs to be able to do is to say that he, to declare victory domestically. And since he controls the narrative, 
he can declare victory sort of in whatever he wants. Now, the question is then, I think the bigger question is, does he want to? And that's where I don't see any sign at the moment at all. And if you read what is you know, being published in the Russian press now, it is, it is still, and in fact, even more so, you know, this is a program of denazification and we have to denazify Ukraine and you know, the West is fueling and, and supporting Nazis in Ukraine. And this is a you know, historic mission that is necessary to do. And that narrative is still being intensified. And so I don't see any sign yet of any desire to move to an off ramp. But I think that's more because of what Putin wants rather than that there isn't a potential for creating an off ramp. While we're looking for signs at one parts per billion, I fear, um, seeing any indication that our friends in China might be having second thoughts about their support for Russia in this endeavor? No, alas, I don't really think so. I think maybe they're a bit more embarrassed now. Um, uh, you know, the the Chinese ambassador at the UN, you know, was slightly squirming this week. I think the the sort of um, the horrific you know, war crimes are, are embarrassing, but I don't really see any um, substantive change. And I think that that China sees this as a sort of part of what it thinks is the single most important thing, which is the, the, the rivalry and the tension between America and China. And it thinks that, you know, it has always convinced itself that, you know, Putin's actions are okay because they were done in the face of Western aggression. Um, but I don't think, and this is important, I don't think that, that Xi Jinping thinks of Putin as some sort of, you know, serious partner or some sort of, you know, equivalent figure in a kind of alliance of autocracies. Putin is very much the junior partner and Russia is immensely useful to China as a source of natural resources, whether it's, you know, commodities, grains, whether it's oil, whether it's gas down the road. Uh, and, and it is, I think, very effective and useful for China to have this kind of um, junior partner there. But I don't think uh, Xi Jinping thinks of this as, as anything be other than sort of a useful part of his broader um, determination to move center stage, which is where China appropriately should be, and as he sees it, the sort of, you know, irreversible and terminal decline of the West. I mean, I think that's how he sees this. And so I don't know, I don't think China is suddenly going to wake up and say, I'm going to, they're going to play some sort of mediating role. They're going to, you know, talk sense into Putin at all. I got a million more Ukraine questions. I'm probably channeling the audience that way, but let's just take a breather, deep breath, Let's switch gears and then, you know, we have audience questions and I can already see there's going to be some Ukraine. So we'll return uh, because there's a lot left still unsaid. We haven't talked about uh, renewable energy and, uh, and all that stuff. But let's a um, little bit of macro U.S. because we're at a moment in this country where I'm talking to you from. Um, what do you think, Zanny, are the chances the Fed gets its interest rates just right and engineers just enough of a landing to kill off inflation and then good kind of growth can move on from there? Low, I think. <laughs> um, uh, I think low because uh, firstly, history suggests that it's jolly hard. Um, there have, as now everybody knows, been three soft landings in the post-war period. But in each of those, inflation was substantially lower than it is now and unemployment higher. And so the degree of gear shift, if you will, that was needed was less. Um, so I think it's just really hard to pull this off. And I think if you look at, um, you know, if you look at futures rates, the, you can see that. So that I'm not sure that, I think increasingly people think it's gonna be very hard to pull this off. Uh, I'm, you know, Larry Summers was right. And although he's telling the world now that he's, I mean, it, he's very public about how right he was, I think he was right and he is right now when he says it's going to be much harder than the Fed thinks. That would be my take on it. I, I, I just- think Jerome Powell thinks it's hard. Uh, he was at the National Association of Business Economics, I don't know, a week and a half ago. 
And he said, you know, the, I'm paraphrasing, but on the key word, I'm not paraphrasing. He said, you know, the goal is to engineer a soft landing. But then he said, or soft-ish, which sounds like a hard <laughs> landing. An admission I mean, that it's it, it frantic then, right? Soft-ish would be good. Soft-ish is better than hard, um, you know, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, you know, the labor market is really overheating. Unemployment is extraordinarily low. Inflation is very high. It was deemed to be transitory for a very long time. And so there's a lot of catch up going on. And, and you know, real rates are unbelievably low still. There's just a very, very long way to go before you get anywhere near positive territory. I don't think there's any business executives I've seen striding proudly to the podium to say this, but I'm hearing this in private conversations. Uh, I don't know if it's a, a grim joke, but uh, a little bit of noise about businesses quietly hoping for a, a little recession to make it easier for them to hire people and presumably also not to pay the extra wages that we have to pay now. Yeah. I, and, so the question to you yeah, is, is, I, that, is that dangerous thinking or? Talk about pushing for a little recession. Let me, let me tell you one other reason beyond the US that I worry, which is, the US is going through what what we've just been talking about. And, uh, you know, can the Fed engineer a soft landing an overheating economy and an inflation problem? In Europe, you have something else you you have an inflation problem caused really by exploding fuel by exploding energy costs. And you have as a result, a fairly big energy shock and possibly if this war goes in the direction I fear it will an even bigger energy shock. You've got more commodity price pressure coming down the line. So Europe's economy is fragile for a different reason. Then if you look at China, you have a, 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 a also a slowdown and a slowdown exacerbated by what is now looks like, you know, a, an Omicron, you know, zero tolerance strategy that is proving unsustainable. And that is hitting the Chinese economy and I think can, will, is likely to hit it quite a lot more. So you have three different kinds of shocks on different time horizons, but happening pretty much simultaneously. So I would worry about, you know, wishing one of them on to, to too much because the world economy is in a pretty fragile position if you put those three things together, I think. And then poorer countries, emerging market countries have extra challenges. First of all, the food is getting so expensive um, to feed people, but also with interest rates going higher in the US, money leaves those countries. Absolutely. They, so they have the, they are hit when interest rates rise. And I think you're right. The food shock is the, is the part of the commodity shock that I think we haven't really seen the full ripple effects of yet. And that hits emerging markets, particularly North Africa, you know, certain emerging markets, particularly hard. And, the, you know, by some measures, the, sh the food shock, um, the wheat and grain shock is going to be as big as possibly anything that we've seen since the First World War. And the reason is that Russia and Ukraine, I mean, there's classic, you know, the breadbasket of Europe is a well-known phrase, but they really do produce, I think it's 30% of grain, of wheat sold internationally is produced in Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine isn't, plant, you know, there's no planting going on right now. The spring planting season is right now. It's not happening, or hardly any is. Russia's un, you know, is under sanctions. There is the, the cost that is going to come from ongoing conflict. And then the sort of the next bit that I think people pay or well, some people pay less attention to, those countries and Belarus too are large suppliers of potash, which is an important ingredient in fertilizer, along with high natural gas prices, means that fertilizer prices have gone through the roof. And so not only planting, but also, you know, yield enhancing inputs have become prohibitively expensive. And so next year's supply is likely to be hit. So there is a, there is a, and I I'm slightly hesitate to say this to an audience in Chicago, where there are going to be far more people who know more about this than I do, but my, uh, everything I've read suggests that that food commodity shock has a long way to go yet. The economist doesn't like tariffs. I mean, you kind of like trade. I know that's that's the general posture, but is it time to rethink these global supply chains? I mean, they seem so vulnerable. Uh, it's, it's one of the lessons of the past two years. What have we learned about supply chains other than they can really mess up? So, um, so we've learned that it's a mistake to rely overwhelmingly on one supplier. 
you know, Germany's overwhelming dependence on Russian gas is uh, a very big vulnerability. But I would conclude from that that you need diversity of supply, not that you need to rely only on your own uh, on, on production at home. So the conclusion is really interesting, David, the conclusion that many countries are reaching now, whether it's semiconductors or whether it's gas, is that you need strategic autonomy and you need to produce more at home and you need to kind of have domestic sources of supply. That's where the kind of inner free trader in me balks and says that's, an, that's a recipe for a balkanized global economy for huge inefficiencies and actually not necessarily for greater security. Because if you rely only on production at home, you know, there are new vulnerabilities that you bring in. You get, I think, resilient supply chains when you have diversified sources of supply. And that's where I hope the global trading system goes, that you have much greater focus on more than one source of supply. But I worry that what we'll, the direction we'll go in is a sort of yet another new reason for the protectionism that so many politicians love. And we'll put up protective barriers and you know, everything needs to be brought home. And even you know, President Biden in the State of the Union this year was remarkably protectionist, I thought, in the kind of, you know, all these things now have to be produced in America by American workers. That is a recipe for a much less efficient global economy. But you would expect me to say that, wouldn't you? <laughs> no, but, hey, what about Biden's leadership in, in all this? Uh, uh, how is he perceived from outside the country? And, and how also would you rate EU leadership? You can keep it focused on Ukraine. On Ukraine. I think on Ukraine, um, he, he's done extraordinarily well. Um, I think we are very lucky that the President of the United States is someone who is uh, a seasoned transatlanticist, who really understands these issues, and who is really committed to you know, working through NATO. I think he's handled it, you know, really excellently actually and in stark contrast to afghanistan last year where i think it was you know regardless of whether you thought it was a sensible decision for the us to leave even if you thought the us did need to leave afghanistan the way in which it was done at least for those of us outside the united states was unnecessarily uh, kind of chaotic and likely to to cause the sort of outcome that it did end up causing in contrast Ukraine has been handled extremely well from the, you know, sharing of intelligence, which we talked about earlier, which was, you know, a, a bold and incredibly effective thing to do to the way in which the United States has led the kind of charge for coming up with a strong sanctions package. And it was clearly before the invasion, it was the US that was was the sort of driver in ensuring that there was this sort of pre organized set of sanctions amongst the Western allies to the focus on providing military equipment, um, to the ongoing, uh, you know, discussion and coordination with the Ukrainians. I think it's been really, really impressive. The, the, the Europeans have reacted, you know, more strongly um, and impressively than I think I might have anticipated. And certainly than in the, you know, when you look at what happened after Russia's invasion of Crimea in 2014, which was effectively nothing, uh, it's striking the difference this time around. And the biggest change has been in Germany, where, you know, President Schultz and um, Chancellor Schultz, um, you know, the, the sort of on that Sunday after the Russian invasion stood up in the Bundestag and in a half hour speech essentially ripped up, you know, decades of German doctrine with the commitment to greater military spending, with the commitment to supply um, military equipment, you know, with the commitment to sanctions. But in Germany, Germany is also the country that worries me now, because I think having had this very strong, very striking shift, Zeitenwende, it's called in German, a change of time, um, it's now the country, because of its dependence on uh, Russian gas, that is most reluctant to do more in the way of sanctions. And it is likely, I think, to be the break on the most robust possible European response. But there again, I think the United States is playing a really important role in sort of, you know, corralling, cajoling, keeping the, the, the kind of European, the Western alliance together on this. And so, you know, very high marks to the US administration. And back to Germany, I mean, it, it ain't easy being German on issues involving natural gas and oil and, 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 uh, and energy. I mean, they're, 
trying to do three things. They don't want incredibly expensive energy for their people. They're trying to convert to renewables and they're trying, they have, you know, security issues. They're trying to get off of the uh, dependency on now Russia. Um, does that mean, what do you think? What does that mean for the campaign, not just in Germany, but beyond toward renewables? I mean, Germany's turning off its nuclear power plants even this year. So, so first of all, I think if we're if we're focusing on Germany, I think they have you know we have one has to call them out for some very very um, you know, with hindsight stupid decisions in the past, like the commitment to turn off all their nuclear, which has made the transition to green energy much harder, and is the reason that actually Germany's emissions have not gone down in recent years, and Germany is one of the you know countries that still burns horrible lignite coal, so. Germany both managed to not actually do very much on on greenery and be incredibly reliant on Russian gas. Um, so it hadn't, you know, it hasn't done that very well hitherto. But right now, the new the new government, the SPD Green Alliance, is determined to sort of accelerate the green transition. Uh, and you know, they prior to the invasion, the focus was that they were going to do more investment in green infrastructure, all of that kind of stuff. Now there is an imperative to very quickly diversify sources of uh, get to, to reduce this dependence on, on Russian gas. And they've um, committed to building LNG terminals. They're going to, they've been you know, scrambling to get LNG from all over the place, particularly from Qatar. Uh, it will, I think, it depends, it depends what happens. If there is a full on embargo of Russian gas or indeed if the Russians stop selling gas, then there will be probably in the short term Perforce a shift to, you know, they'll need more coal. They'll they'll be sort of an all hands on deck attempt to maintain energy sources, which will not necessarily reinforce the green agenda. But over the next sort of, you know, ten years, let's say on a five to ten year basis, there is actually a way in which diversification of European energy sources and the green agenda are complementary. You build up, you know, the kind of infrastructure you need to get wind power from places where it's windy to where it's less windy. You build up that infrastructure from the north to the south of Germany because the wind's in the north and the industry is in the south. All of that stuff can't happen in the next six months, but it can happen over the next few years. Similarly, there's a lot of talk now about building natural gas pipelines towards North Africa that down the road can be, the hope is, the pipelines through which you can get green hydrogen. Now, there's some skepticism about how quickly that can happen, but there is a way in which you can dovetail Europe's focus on going green with a more diversified energy set of energy sources in the medium term. In the short term, it's going to be virtually impossible. But I think the challenge will be not just for Europe, actually, across the board to to be more diversified, less dependent on Russia, but not completely give up the green agenda. And that that's going to be the challenge that certainly the Germans more than anybody faces. But they've, you know, they've put themselves in a pretty tough position. I mean, the, the most sensible thing they could do would be to give up on this idea of getting rid of nuclear. That would give them in the medium term another source of, you know, green and non-Russian energy. We could talk for a long time about the complexity of nuclear power, but let's get to some audience questions. The perfect time right now. Um, I'll start with one from one of our members of the audience named Howard Tiffin. Um, he's curious about the place you work for. How has the work of The Economist changed as you've pivoted to podcasts and it says webinars here? But I mean, like, how did you stay alive in this digital world? Um, well, I hope we're doing more than staying alive. I hope we're, you know, I like to think we're right. thriving. I hope um, <laughs> the answer is a, it's a good question. and and. I now think of the the kind of weekly economist, whether it's on the app or whether it's in print, as the sort of central DNA of a whole ecosystem that is built around it. And and those of you who who are subscribers and who have our app will know that we produce you know daily content and we produce a, a whole array of of content beyond the weekly. And and the idea is that you know from the the what we call the world in brief, which is a sort of very regularly updated during the Ukraine crisis. It was hourly. It's now kind of three hourly updated, 30 second catch up. What's important in the world? Um, that's the sort of, you know, one end. 
through to through sort of daily analysis to the weekly analysis to the new sub, sort of additional things we've added we now have a, a, a by invitations which are as our kind of global op-ed page we get interesting um, contributions from outside voices we have much more sort of personalized reportage from our eyewitness pieces which are written much more in the style of sort of the not much less analytical than the core economist much more vivid reportage you put all of that together with as you say with the podcasts with videos that it's a kind of ecosystem that has as its heart the same dna which is authoritative impartial objective rigorous but there are different ways to consume our journalism and different people at different times of the week will consume it in different ways so, and and the ukraine crisis has been actually a sort of way in which all of this has come together and we've seen not just you know our app uses at an all-time high uh you know web views have surged our podcast listens have completely surged so it's people are are coming to our journalism for different reasons at different times and and it's no longer just you sit down and read the weekly although that's absolutely sort of central it's just it's the core of a much broader um set of ways to get our journalism out to people and i hope that means that you know, whatever the way you want to consume our journalism you can find a way to do so that suits that's 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 the goal anyway and it's not just new technology that presented opportunities but also challenges different ways of talking to an audience um laurent terry vell i'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, the last name as a follow-up question, he feels the economist sometimes feels like a lonely voice in the wilderness compared to partisan shouting that you see in other media or rampant misinformation. He worries about publications like yours getting drowned out with all the noise. How do you keep connecting when you don't embrace polarization, I guess, is, is what the question implies here. It's a really, it's a very good question. It's something we, are, we think about all the time. Um, I feel very strongly that the heart of what we do is, and, and actually the sort of purpose of The Economist is to be a rigorous, authoritative, uh, fair-minded voice that even if you disagree with us, you find a credible and and useful source of information. So that rigor, you know, we have everything is fact checked. Even even the kind of breaking news stories, even the the sort of daily analysis that comes out of Ukraine, everything is fact checked from a big fact checking team. We take we take the sort of rigor of our work very seriously, and we take its fair mindedness very seriously. Now, if you if you if you are a subscriber, you know we are a, a liberal in the classic English sense of the term, a liberal newspaper champions certain values. We don't make any bones about that where you know we our editorials are very clearly have a viewpoint but they are based on fact-based rigorous analysis and i think that really matters now i like to think that that is a differentiator in a world where you know many many media organizations have become kind of more partisan and and particularly in the united states where i think it's not just that people people argue from different partisan perspectives. I think increasingly in the United States, people actually don't have the same fact base. And uh, David, I think I've told you this before, but whenever I go to the US, I force myself to watch um, either Fox in the morning and MSNBC in the evening or vice versa. And it's 15 minutes of each. And it's not fun. Um, I don't particularly enjoy it, but I find it essential to get a sense of the sort of extremes of what's going on in America. And increasingly, you could be watching two different countries. I mean, you, I feel like I'm in two different countries, depending on which one I'm watching. And that is, to me, a very, very frightening situation when you 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 literally the sort of two sides are inhabiting different different universes, different sets of facts. And so what we try and do is you know, be a be sort of genuinely fact based and rigorous. Are we you know, how much of a difference can we make? Well, you know, we're uh, I think I think we have some influence. We have quite a lot of reach now. I mean, through our podcast, through our, we have something on the order of 60 million social media followers across different platforms. So there's, we, we can get the word out, but I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not kind of pretending that we can, you know, single-handedly make a huge difference. But I think there is a, there is a, an appetite amongst a growing number of people 
for that kind of journalism. And so I hope that in our sort of smallish way, we can make a contribution to having a, you know, a, a, a kind of media environment where, where rigor and facts really matter. Hey, just briefly, you almost always clarify this. You didn't this time. You said you're, you and the magazine are proud liberals. You don't mean Rachel Maddow. Quite right. Yeah. <laughs> I should say uh, that. What, yes, what is I, liberal I, in your I context. Take, I take that for granted. Liberal in the English sense of the word, which is a belief in open societies, free markets, individual um, freedom, the kind of John Stuart Mill liberalism of the 19th century, not liberal as now defined in the US, which is a very um, particular sort of subset of liberalism. So it, we are not we are not American liberals. We are classic English liberals. Here's a question from uh, Wolfgang Messinger, who is Consul Germany of, of uh, uh, Consul General of Germany uh, and has experience on the ground in um, in Ukraine. He asks, Danny, what do you make of Putin's concentration on cities in the east of Ukraine, Kharkiv, Mariupol? These are cities, he writes, uh, um, where leaders were among the most critical of Ukraine's Western orientation. Is this strategic or is it also some sort of, some form of, it says, revenge out of maybe disappointment in, in where the Eastern cities stood? So, um, Wolfgang, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and you're probably better equipped to answer it than I am. But my sense is, is twofold. One, that some of this shift, this very recent shift, is sort of a, a shift per force because the broader strategy of you know, rolling into Kiev and it all being over in 48 hours is not working. Secondly, I think there is a, um, a kind of strategic goal of having the sort of annexing, if you will, the Eastern industrial side, not much bigger than just Luhansk and Donetsk, but the sort of the Eastern industrial side. And then if you get to Mariupol, you obviously cut off the Azov Sea and you, you know, the, the most ambitious interpretation is to then try and get the south, um, southern, to, southern route towards Odessa. Whether that is driven by um, a punishment or whether it is driven by a sense, if which if you read, read that 4,000 word tome that Putin wrote last summer, of a genuine sense that Ukraine as a modern independent country, he just doesn't recognize its right to exist. And, and one of the things that um, President Zelensky told me, he said, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said something like, Putin's been in a bunker, not just for six months or two years, but for two decades, not literally, but he doesn't understand the country that Ukraine has become. And he doesn't understand and doesn't recognize modern Ukraine's right to exist. So the, the modern westward looking country that Ukraine has become, particularly actually in the last eight years since since Maidan, is one that Putin just, it, he, he, it's not in his worldview. He doesn't recognize that country's right to exist. And I think that's driving a lot of it. And, and what I think is going to be really interesting is that in those Eastern areas, Russian speaking, much more oriented towards Russia, the loathing and hatred of the Russians is now just as extreme or just as, as powerful as it was and is in the West of the country. I, I talked to a couple of people while I was in Kiev who had been in Kharkiv and they said that you know, the residents of Kharkiv, which is of a, a city very close to the Russian border, very Russian oriented, very Russian speaking, the anger at the Russians there at how the Russians have destroyed this city, which is a beautiful city. The, uh, and this was before any of the evidence of, of war crimes near Kiev came out. The, the visceral anger at what the Russians have done is going to, I think, reinforce even more powerfully um, the sense of Ukraineness, and so that logic that you cite, I think, is going to be even harder to to sustain. Putin is not going to be able to. He may be able to hold. He may be able to kind of conquer the territory by flattening it, which seems to be the current approach. But I don't see how the Russians can hold this territory in any meaningful manner, unless they just simply all the populations have gone, because there is such 
fury and loathing of what the Russians are doing. The Economic Club of Chicago allows us to pause to think. So you can take a moment to think before answering this question. Andy Crestadina asks, if you could interview Putin, what would you ask him? It's a very, very good question. Um, Maybe I get three. Uh, how about three, a three question, a three word question. President Putin, what the hell? <laughs> you can do that. Uh, I think the first question is, you know, what, what settlement will you agree to? Where we started this conversation, you know, I wouldn't, you wouldn't yeah. call it an offer, but what is, what is a, what is a Russian, I mean, what does a Russian victory look like? What does a Russian, what is a, what is a kind of rush, what can Russia live with here? What is Russia's end game in this? Um, the second is, uh, how you have, you have, as a result of your actions, President Putin, Russia has regressed three or four decades. You have hundreds of thousands of your most educated citizens have left. Your economy is on its knees. You no longer have the capacity to get the high tech equipment that you were able to get before. How is this good for your people? Hmm. I wouldn't you, expect you mentioned more. Yeah, well, um, we were talking about China and Russia, and you didn't see much signs that uh, China is rethinking its alliance with Russia on this whole Ukraine thing. Um, you sense maybe a little bit of uh, discomfort on the part of, of, of one Chinese official. Jeffrey Moss asks, though, do you think this is actually a huge positive for China? If Russia fails, it positions China as the number two superpower for sure. And if Russia wins, it strengthens China's relationship with Russia. Does China lose in any scenario here? I think um, there are ways in which this is uncomfortable for China. I think it depends a little bit on how uh, strong and sustained the kind of Western alliances and the rediscovery of the importance of the Western alliance. Now, one of the things we haven't touched on, David, is that there is a remarkably sort of strong and united response from NATO, but there are a lot of countries um, in the rest of the world that are sitting on the fence and that have, have very um, carefully not explicitly condemned the invasion and not supported the Western Alliance, India being the most prominent, but also several countries in the Middle East and a number of countries in Africa and Latin America. I think over the coming months, um, an interesting and important question is going to be what happens to those countries and do they, are they sort of forced to pick a side and if they do, where does it go? Because as a result, will determine whether this is a kind of important positive or how important and positive a moment it is for the West. Because I think there is an, there's a sense in which you know, the West was full of self-doubt, full of, um, you know, in the aftermath of what many saw as sort of the hubris of the unipolar moment in the early 21st century, the debacle of Iraq, the, you know, disastrous um, or the whatever, however you want to describe Afghanistan, uh, a sense of Western weakness, internal weakness, you know, increasingly people from the rest of the world looked at the United States and said it's so divided internally, how can it possibly lead a, an alliance? Looked at Europe and thought this is a kind of talking shop, it can never get its act together and do anything. And I think the Europeans certainly, but the West more broadly has sort of surprised itself at the degree of its resolve. I would argue that more needs to be done, but nonetheless, a remarkable amount has been done. And the popular support, both in Europe, but also in the United States, I think, for the Ukrainians, the sense in which this has really touched public imagination and public outrage and public sense of, you know, uh, 
why lofty things like freedom matter. All of that, I think, helps reinforce Western resolve. And that's potentially leads to an environment where actually China faces a competitor that it had always thought was sort of inexorably on the decline. And actually, you know, it may have to recalibrate that. All right, we're almost done here. I have a couple quick questions. Let's just do, if you'd be so kind, truth or myth, okay? What looks and feels and tastes like a magazine that you work for, The Economist, what is it called? It is called actually a newspaper. Truth or myth? True. True. We call ourselves a newspaper, but as we have been talking, the newspaper is, you know, at the center of a, of a much broader ecosystem that you can call whatever you like. And you can call it a magazine too, if you like, but we call it a newspaper. It, it, the reason is it was not, it was a newspaper when we were founded in 1843. That's what they were called then. And we always stuck with calling it a newspaper. Another one. Uh, is this true or is this an urban myth? For months, if not years, The Economist sent to the printers each and every week two covers, one with next week's cover and another some kind of backup cover with Chinese Premier Deng Xiaoping dying. <laughs> and that in the end, your publication schedule was out of sync with his death and uh, you never used it. Is that true? You know, I, it, I mean, if it's an urban myth, it's one that hasn't reached me. I, you, put, you obviously know the history of my organization better than I do. I didn't know about that. Um, I can go back and check. I don't know. It was it was loose talk from your newsroom at one point. Um, it may well be true. I, I, it was before my time, I, I'm sorry to say. And lastly, truth or myth, every editor in chief of your newspaper must know something about the British Corn Laws of the first half of the 19th century. Is this true? Well, yeah, you must know something because the, the Economist was founded to fight against them. That was the that was the reason for the founding of The Economist. So James Wilson, the famous hat maker from Scotland who founded the newspaper, um, he founded it as part of a, 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 a kind of campaign to fight against the Corn Laws, to fight for free trade. So yes, it would be hard to, to do my job and not know what the Corn Laws were. And corn in this context means corn, but it also corn. may not mean corn. Yeah, corn means, corn means wheat. It doesn't mean, it means grain, it does not mean maize. Americans call maize corn, we call it maize. We thought we knew everything about our British cousins, but I have a feeling four-fifths of the audience did not know that detail. Zanny, thank you for being so generous with us.